I thought I'd just say a little bit about what I'm thinking about these days. Um, so I'm thinking a lot about the different visions of the future that we have. So we have some very optimistic, high-tech visions of the future that you see in some kinds of science fiction movies. And then we also have some very grim, dystopian visions of the future, uh, especially if you read about global warming and you learn that by the end of the century, the Earth could easily be seven or 10 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it is now. That would mean that places like Los Angeles would be much harder to live in. The Colorado River that supplies Los Angeles will be dried out because of the less snowpack up, up north. So it'd be like the Salton Sea? Places like that, yeah. So place, civilizations can just sort of shrivel up and, and die. Um, so Iraq, for example, which is largely desert, back, back in the, uh, back in like several hundred BC, it was covered with forests, but they just cut down those, those forests and, and so changed the climate. It was like climate. chaparral kind of? I think it was actually forested. It was not, I mean, better than, I don't, uh, I forget exactly what counts as chaparral, but it was nice forest, basically. It was a lush green place and they basically sort of ruined it. Uh, so, so I think a lot about the, the, the future and, and the different kind of things that can hold. And I'm trying to imagine some kind of real, I'm trying to imagine what the future will really be like so that we can try to, of course, what we do will affect the future, but I'd like to be able to be doing things that are sort of realistic, not crazy, unrealistic things. Like, for example, some people say, oh, let's build Mars colonies, but I don't actually think that we should be spending our time building Mars colonies. Right this now. is just as crazy as those people suggesting we should make a Dyson swarm or sphere for Mercury, right? <laughs> it's yeah, well, it's this, ridiculous. <laughs> well, at this stage, it's ridiculous. I don't think it's ever, at some point, those would be great things to do, but I think we're, we're heading up for the next hundred years or so with some really serious problems here on Earth that we need to f focus on and get our act together, basically, before we, we start uh, expanding out into space. Because if we, we could expand out into space and a few people might make it, but most of the people on Earth are never going to get out into space. And we have to learn how to deal with things here. And so I'm trying to imagine a vision of the future where it seems it's going to be something like this. Some parts of the world are going to be collapsing and suffering from really serious uh, droughts. Ecological collapse? E ecological collapse. Just like a Jared Diamond, you know. Yeah, hypothesis. that's right. Yeah, so, and, <clears throat> and that always goes along with, I mean, that's connected to social collapse because when people, when things get bad and people start fighting each other for the last little crumbs of resources, then things get worse than if they were somehow noble enough to all cooperate and stick together. But I don't think you can really count on people staying noble when, when, when things are getting worse for everybody, right? So there'll be, people tend to fight. So there'll be some places I think that are gonna be like that, but I don't, but I'm not completely gloomy. I don't actually think that the whole world is gonna to go to hell. And I certainly don't think the human humans are gonna go, go extinct. Um, so we could imagine that there might be some places that get their acts together in time and actually manage to develop sustainable societies and then can use all the wonderful technology we've got to keep on advancing and becoming really amazing places. So, so, so just think of that complicated mix that things might be like in the future. It's very, very hard, it's hard to, hard to keep in mind. It's, it's easy to imagine like everything getting bad and it's easy to imagine everything getting good, but I don't think either of those is going to be what it is. It's going to be something more complicated. As the universe always surprises us, correct? Right, yeah. Yeah, anything that, I mean, it's true that anything we can really foresee is probably not going to be what really happens, but... <laughs> <laughs> it's always like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, still I, but still I can't resist trying to uh, get some kind of handle on, on where, we're, where we're heading. Um, so, because, and I think if we think about that, it can help us figure out some ideas about what are good things to be doing right now. When you mentioned the next hundred years, it's just like, is, what do you mean by that? Is our progression into a Kardashev level one society? Well, we're, 
we were basically mastering like the resources of an entire planet like the energy resources of is that what you mean so i forget the exact scale there well, yeah, it well, is mastering, well mastering. zero is the one we're in yeah, one is planetary <laughs> and then two is the solar uh, and then three okay. is galactic so yeah yeah well, right so the way i think of it is that we're we're right now we're in the transition where we're realizing that there's there's no separation between us and nature so once upon a time you can imagine like nature is this huge big thing and people are like these little measly ants that don't have much effect on nature but by now we're actually like using for example 25 percent of the vegetation on earth is yes. being used by people and so the idea that there's like wilderness somewhere is basically false now everywhere is affected by people yeah even the amazon yeah everywhere yeah even yeah that's right antarctica is about the least affected but of course that's the one place we don't get much good out of right now um so so right so we have to we are in the process of facing up to the fact that nature and us are the same thing we are nature and we're the planet is us basically what we do is going to be what determines the way the planet is going to be be and that involves like meeting new levels of responsibility treat acting about the world in a more responsible way which you know the very first step is like when you like throw back in the back when i was a kid like in the 60s people would still throw tons of trash out the window when they were driving down the highway in the United States, they still do that in Cambodia, but 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 here it's like you're regarded like a real evil slob if you just like throw your crap out the no, and it's even window. it's and that's like a matter of growing up because when you're a kid, you throw stuff around and you just assume that somehow magically it's going to get taken care of. I mean, it's funny because it's like the, the, when you mentioned that if you go to cent Central Europe, it's even like that in Germany where like there's different levels of categorization of yeah, the trash. It's like that's right. this is a hard plastic, there's PTE, and then yeah, there's paper right. and different kinds of paper. It's yeah, that's right. So in San Francisco, they're actually trying to go for a zero waste uh, city plan that is not have any stuff put into landfill like a, a Subaru plant <laughs> <laughs> so they have right now they've right now 80% of the stuff in San Francisco gets recycled one way or another or composted um, but it could go but they're aiming for zero I don't think it's ever gonna go to, to zero but yeah so we're in a we're in a, a self-contained ecosystem there's no trash can for the whole earth where you, you yeah. know he's... well the radius of earth is finite yeah I mean, that's right yeah, that's so. right we're learning that the we're grappling with the fact that the earth is really finite and that we're dominating the whole planet and and so, we're only in that surface layer to the diameter of the earth so. yeah yeah that's right so um so yeah you could say it's 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 uh, learning to be a planetary civilization and it's not going to come easy because we we haven't really we haven't really cottoned on to that fact yet. We're just sort of charging ahead, burning fossil fuels to run our whole civilization as if you could do that without having any substantial effect. And uh, by the time everyone notices that there's a substantial effect, it's just really nothing you can much, you can't reverse that effect very easily. It's very, very hard to remove huge amounts of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So we're gonna go, whoops, Wow, it wasn't, wouldn't it have been good if like a couple hundred years ago we, were, we had gotten smart. Well, we stuck with this somewhat damaged planet um, and uh, we'll just have to make the best of it. We'll make the best of it some, <laughs> hopefully. In the so, so ultimately you're an, op you're an optimist? Uh, I guess you could say so. <laughs> I'm not sure I, I would exactly say that. but I, but I think that a pragmatist. I, mean, I, try to, I try to think of myself as a realist, but I guess everyone does. You know, so, so um, I, I think we're going, we're going through a, we're beginning to go through a tough stretch here, where we, where we slightly too late realize that the planet is finite, and that means we have to, we can't throw out any type of stuff and not expect that it's gonna have an effect well if you can list like maybe like four or five things an individual can do to add to that you know to sure so yeah so for people like me who are who are like businessmen or academics who have the opportunity to travel a lot for the work for their work the one quickest easiest way to cut your carbon footprint is to 
is to take fewer plane trips, to not take so many plane trips. Because each, if you take about four normal size, four or five normal size plane trips, that easily equals like the average amount of carbon dioxide emission by an average person in the planet. So, so I, I know academics who are like going to conferences all the time, just zipping around the successful ones, the really successful ones, because you get invited. Celebrity to academics. Well, not yeah. celebrity academics, just six, very yeah, successful ones. Um, and, and those people don't really necessarily understand what, what it is that they're doing. And so, so anyway, I've been trying to cut back on, on unnecessary plane travel. And that, that's because that's the most painless way to cut your carbon footprint. If you're the sort of person who does that kind of plane travel. Um, for people who don't do any plane trips or very, very few plane trips, then I guess the next biggest impacts are, um, are driving cars and heating your house. And I mean, in terms of like the amount of energy that gets, that gets used. So living near to your job, if you can, is a great thing. It makes you much happier to, as I, I walk to work a lot of the time and I, I, each morning I turn on the radio news and I hear about all the traffic jams in LA. <laughs> like, yeah, this freeway stuck. I'm, I'm guilty of that because I live 30 miles away from where oh, I work. Yeah. So, 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 so you'll, be, you'll be happier and uh, have more spare time and and uh, we we'll live seven years. Lower blood pressure. Well, we we'll live seven years less too. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so that then another one, which is much less glamorous than either of these, even is just a, is just a heating and cooling of of the house. So heat energy is much more has much more energy in it than you'd expect. So like you could leave all your lights on all the time, uh, and that would be anywhere 